All right, everybody, welcome to another Ink and Paint Club review here on the Ink and Paint Club channel. My name is JD, and uh, I wasn't going to bother Kyle with this. <laughs> um, this week, I have enlisted uh, the Tales crew from our Tales of Vesperia review back in way, way, I don't remember when. Uh, but Luca is back. Hey, everybody. Glad to be back. Yeah. Luca, you were on for a, some Final Fantasy thing. Which which one did we do? The Final Fantasy VII movie. Advent That's Children. right. That's right. And making his return, uh, Darren, we have back as well. I'm glad to be back and talk more Tales. It's been a hell of a long time since I've had a chance to sit down and talk about Tales. Hey, man, any, any opportunity to get you back on here, I am pumped for that. So, um, for no real reason, uh... I decided I wanted to do a review. Or Luke, I think you and I were maybe talking about this. Uh, doing a review on Tales of Zestaria the X, which I. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. This is a Japanese anime. This is Tales of Zestaria the Cross. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why I have you guys on here because I'm a very average American white man and don't know these things. <laughs> Whereas we Canadians know all this Japanese stuff. Exactly. You guys are well-versed. It, it, Did it, you it's go like... around calling that 3DS game Project X-Zone or Project Cross-Zone? Come on. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed to admit I said, I said X-Zone for a bit <laughs> before I was corrected. <laughs> I mean, it's a Japanese thing. I know. I should have learned after it was Street, Fo Street Fighter Cross Tekken or whatever. But or Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> With oh, Kingdom God. Hearts Chi. Uh, <laughs> God damn it, Japan. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yesterday and a little bit of today, I sat down and watched the entire first season, which is what we're going to talk about, of Tales of Hysteria, The Cross. There you Glad go. I got that corrected. There we go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and I'll be perfectly honest, you guys. I don't know what the fuck happened. <laughs> I watched <laughs> last night. I watched about the first eight episodes. I skipped uh, half of an episode because I guess there's two episodes where they flash back to Bazaria. And I asked Luca if these are crucial to the plot. Cause I was like not enthralled with it at all. Um, so I, Darren, since you are the, since you've got a channel where you talk about tales, why don't you kind of like run us through like what's going on? Here? Certainly. So this is an anime adaptation by UFO Table, a very well-known Japanese animation studio, renowned for a lot of different Fate Stay Night works, and they have handled, I think, since the Tales of Exilia games, all of the openings. Hmm. And they did and... A Tales of Symphonia anime adaptation before. So this is an adaptation of Tales of Hysteria, which is probably one of the most controversial releases in the Tales series in terms of the fandom. Some hmm. people really oh, yeah. like it. A lot of people ha seem to really hate it. For uh, some reasons we'll be able to get into, because some of those problems kind of carry over to the cross, and some of the strengths, in a way, also carry over. So this, this, is, a fan this is an anime that's set in a fantasy world, where there are beings called seraphim who are like the not necessarily physical but they're like the embodiments of different elements and spirits which have forms like animals or like humans and to most people they are invisible they can't be seen but seraphim are almost like angels in a way or like they're holy in which people kind of used to pray to them to make good stuff happen or for good fortune as they control the elements and nature and there's people who are essentially you know, normal people, and they used to coexist with Seraphim a long time ago. And a guy called the Shepherd, not Commander Shepherd, he, this is a <laughs> different continuity. <laughs> this is a being called the Shepherd who is able to communicate with the Seraphim and kind of be like the bridge of both worlds and like the super ultimate good guy and hero of light. And you can call is... him the Jesus of the universe. Essentially, yeah. And there's always like a Shepherd to kind of guide people and Seraphim together. And currently, in the setting of this anime, there is... People can no longer see the Seraphim. And a princess of a kingdom called Highland, Alicia, 
tries to investigate some of the strange happenings throughout her kingdom. There's like a lot of disease, famine, crazy natural disasters. And amongst the way, she stumbles across the main character, Soray, and his, basically into the village of... Oh, crap. What's the village called? This Elysium. Elysium. Thank you. And essentially, it's a village where Sore grew up, and he essentially grew up near Seraphim all his life, and he is able to see them. And he is essentially, at the start of this anime, the only person in the world who can see and communicate with the Seraphim. And so begins the adventure of a princess and a really, really cliche, nice anime guy. <laughs> like, really cliche, naive, idealist hero type. <laughs> and I think it, we can say this, that's a, it, this is a non-spoiler. Sore becomes the shepherd, and he is, you know, tasked with restoring balance to the different elements to collect the different key elements to fight the Lord of Calamity, the being of all ma ma malevolence in the world, and, you know, get the Master Sword, seal the evil, and save the day. Okay. Pretty so, much. Yeah, see, when you, when you we spell it out like that, yeah, okay, I can kind of follow it now. Because, <laughs> all right, so I, I think I said this last time we talked about Tales. Um, my only knowledge of Tales is Vesper. Like, I played through most of Vesperia. I played a little of Abyss, and I have a very peripheral knowledge of Symphonia. Um, so going into this anime, knowing literally nothing about what Zestera is, I was completely lost through all of this. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and, and I was telling Luca, um, this, cause I was basically, while I was watching this last night, I was like live updating him. And that for the longest time, I could not remember what Saray's name was. <laughs> yeah. But, I was being his, uh, encyclopedia of uh, yeah. tales of Syria lore and knowledge. <laughs> I was. I kept asking. He was like, "Who's that? Who's this Kefka-looking motherfucker? Who's this Flynn-looking motherfucker? Why did he just go Super Saiyan?" <laughs> um. But I was telling Luca last night that um, my biggest problem with this anime, and maybe it's just me, I have the same problem I did with uh, the Final Fantasy King's Glaive movie, in the sense that I feel like it relies a lot on you already knowing what a lot of this is like you it, it relies on you have being already played the game you know who these characters are you know what like this setting and all these creatures are because i feel as to as an outsider this show doesn't explain much of anything to you <laughs> my I... I the issues of having big anime adaptations of really long games like the tales series are this kind of happened to the tales symphonia anime as well where they kind of explain a term once and they move on because there's just no time. Because I think the entire first season of Tales of Zisteria of the Cross covers like roughly 15 hours of gameplay, maybe a little more. It covers basically like the very beginning up to the first encounter with Heldal during the mm -hmm. war, which is like pretty much the beginning arc of the game. But there are so many liberties and changes taken within the anime that, uh, personally, I feel, uh, play out a little stronger than the game's original plot in some points. 100% agree with you. I was actually really surprised at how... Because the, the core story of Tales of Hysteria is really cliche and standard for an rpg it's nothing really special and a lot of people took issue with that with the actual game especially because in the game there's the actual game parts you have to play in between all that so instead of being rewarded with like more a really developing engaging story it's kind of like oh okay here's the next element i got now to go to the other place to get the other element or meet this party member or do that like every other rpg whereas with the anime they have a much kind of they have a better payoff in that regard to the storytelling. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And because you have UFO Table animating it, you have a really, really nice presentation that the game really can't compete with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's... Um, for, as, for as much as I was lost watching this, I did really want <clears throat> to... Sorry. I did really want to commend like how well this is done. 
because watching this, like, the fight scenes are really well choreographed. The animation is, like, beautiful in a lot of spots. Uh, the music's really good, too. Um, because mm-hmm. it's, uh, I don't know if it's, like, the same person who does the, the game music, but it's obviously, like, renditions of the game music, which <laughs> I was talking, when Luke and I were talking last night, um, there was a, there's a battle theme that was going on. It's like, this sounds really similar to Bot and Cryos. <laughs> and it's like, cause I, I, I know that like the tales and, and Bot and Golden Sun all have the same composer. And it's like, wow, they're really just carrying over like the same musical tones. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. And <laughs> oh actually, yeah, definitely. The soundtrack is actually composed by the game's composers as well. And I'm pretty sure there's a number of songs reused. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. They use, a lot of the in-game music, and some of it has even been remixed in a few spots. I know one of the boss battle themes was remixed. I believe it was the fight against the giant bat it was used in. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so something I wanted to talk about, because uh, Luca, you mentioned this to me. Um, how do you guys feel about because obviously I've never played the game. Um, how do you guys feel about like the character interactions, character development of the game versus how uh, how the show does it? Speaking well, of someone... okay, you go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks, Darren. Uh, well, for me personal, personally, um, the game. <sighs> I feel a lot of the characters in the game versus the anime, um, within the game, I felt a lot of them were very one-dimensional. They had one trait, and it was a main focus with them. Or, like, characters like Alicia got the shaft too soon in the game when she was initially introduced to her early departure in the game which 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 was extremely disappointing for me because alicia was portrayed heavily as the female protagonist upon introduction and then she leaves your party permanently very early on in the game and were substituted with rose who honestly feels like a Mary Sue half the time. <laughs> and like out of all the characters though in the game, I honestly felt like the strongest character, no joke of a word, was Edna. And I'm, she was Once again, I am in a hundred percent agreement. Which is sad to say because Edna half the time is very deadpan with her emotions and like the one time you do see emotion from her it's actually the most gut-wrenching moment of the whole game <laughs> in which is you're going off to kill her brother who's been turned into a dragon oh damn which is also shown in the anime well the, the oh, dragon yeah. part the, that that's probably one of the more interesting moments of the entire anime adaptation is see is the introduction of edna and her brother Aizen the dragon, who I don't know the ultimate fate of yet because I've only played about 20 to 25 hours of Tales of Hysteria, then I kind of fell off. So I don't know the conclusion to all that. And I can say from my own experience of watching this anime adaptation, I much prefer how the story's handled here, especially the characters. Like you were saying, Luca, with Alicia, you actually get to see her develop because you get that first, like, almost episode zero of of it only focusing on Alicia and her motivation as to why she's even in Elysium at the beginning of the story, which entails this hysteria you don't get until like four or five hours into the game. Oh my God. And and building on that too, like with what happened to her in the prologue versus like how you meet her first in the game, I'm just like, hi, I'm Alicia. Uh, I just went through some crazy shit show with a fire tornado and a village being destroyed and a little girl being killed in front of me, but, you know, I'm totally fine. (laughs) Whereas in the game, that didn't happen at all. 
Well, yet she's still depressed for some reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. And also, they took out on kind of the earlier point you brought up, JD, about some of the character interactions versus the game. In the game, the point when Mikulo, Mikulio leaves the party to go become like a sub lord, there's a huge squabble in the game, and it's literally over nothing because it ends up getting resolved like really easily anyway. Whereas in this, they left that out, and he just leaves the party and then comes back, and it's handled so much better because of that. Hmm. Yeah, I, oh, yeah. I, I did think it was kind of weird that he just kind of pieces out for a bit. <laughs> but, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, shit. I was going to say something. I don't remember what it is now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I got to say, this this series really starts off, like... like I, I guess... what What is it with the like the giant tornadoes and stuff. Cause I felt like it went this, ep- this, the first episode or the, the prologue episode really, really just throws you into things. Like there's this giant tornado storm that's ravaging the countryside. I guess there's a dragon inside of it. <laughs> um. um, I'll fill that one for you. Um, so like how, uh, Darren mentioned Seraphim in the world. Mm-hmm. It, you remember how I told you how the monsters of the world are just, like, regular humans and animals corrupted by this, like, weird negative energy called malevolence, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, dragons are seraphim corrupted by the malevolence. Oh. So, essentially, the most dangerous monsters in the world are seraphim that have been corrupted. Hmm. So that's why, like, when a dragon's nearby, like, the whole world goes into utter chaos because seraphim control the very elements of the world. So a dragon essentially does that, but on a destructive level. Damn. Yeah, because, fuck, every time, every time one of those things come out, just, like, oh, it just, it, every, everything just goes to shit, like, real fast. And they just come out of nowhere. Just for, like, no reason. It's always funny, too, from a character's perspective that can't see the Seraphim. They're just like, what the hell? It's like a giant tsunami outside. Like, what's mm-hmm. going on? And you see all the characters go like, oh, my God. Like, just having a meltdown, seeing a dragon causing everything. And everyone else is still getting the freak out level. Mm-hmm. But they're kind of just confused, going like, what is this crazy natural disaster? Yeah. And, and kind of on that on that same note, like, it did take me a while to realize that... Um, the seraphim couldn't be seen by normal people because maybe maybe i just like had glanced away while they explained that real quick i didn't realize mikleo or that, that's his name right yeah okay yeah I'm, I'm bad with names so forgive me if i get anybody's name wrong it took me up until the point where uh alicia and saray are on the they're on the patio and um mikleo and the lila lila thank you uh they're all there and they i mean uh, Mikla and Layla are standing there, so to me, that's like, oh, okay, they're just, you know, they're there with their magic or whatever, and then like cuts to Alicia, and then cuts back, and they're gone. I'm like, oh, that's why. <laughs> okay, so I, I don't know. I felt like it didn't. Like, again, you you kind of said like they will explain something real quick and just move on from it, and I guess that's just one thing I missed. So, um, I guess I think in episode one, it happens once when they, when they first meet Alicia and that's kind of it. The only time they really get into detail is in episode one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mikleo makes a passing mention of how she can't see him. Yeah. Cause Um, I, I thought it was so weird that like, she never talks to him in the first episode or or the first time they meet. It was like, well, geez, weird. That's kind of weird. I guess. I mean, she's mostly talking to Saray anyway, but. Um, yeah, so it is kind of weird that that's a thing. Um, oh, <laughs> the one thing, another thing I did actually like about this is I love, um, how they do the next time, uh, the next time uh, caps of the next episode is where they just, oh, the, yeah, 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 the just, episode previous. They do it like a skip yeah, from, like the the skip from the game. And it's like, okay, that's actually really clever that you guys chose to do it that way. Um. Cause I, 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 cause I generally, when I watch uh, an anime, like as soon as the, um, 
the the ending theme song comes on, I'll just flip to the next one. But I, I left one running for a while. It just cuts in and it's like, oh, that's actually kind of funny. Because I actually, re- I, I'm one of those people, and I don't know how other Tales fans, um, you know, operate. But like anytime a prompt comes up for the little skits, I have to, I have to sit down and listen to it because I think a lot of them are really funny. Every time. Every time. A lot oh, of those skits every actually time. contain some of the best character moments, too. Mm-hmm. They really do. And that's what a lot of people love about the Tales game. The skits provide more lore and background and character development through, like, these just little small, little minute it, audios. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm glad, and I, th- I think it was when Vesperia, they went full voice acting. Cause I tried, I was trying to play Abyss and wa- looking to uh, doing the skits, and it's like it was just so painful having to read all of that. Because mm-hmm. readings for nerds. Yeah. <laughs> I remember in Tales of Symphonia being really annoyed by that because they're unskippable oh. unless you skip the entire conversation. So you have to wait as they read it out in the Japanese, but you can't hear anything. Oh. So you're just sitting there. Re- you already read it like 10 seconds ago and you're still waiting for it to go to the next line. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, whereas in like the new Tales of Symphonia Chronicles, you can switch it to Japanese and you can actually hear them talking in the Japanese audio, but you still end up having to read the English subtitles. <laughs> the eternal it's RPG like a... hell of having to read. Yeah. Um. It's the 2000 people get with the times <laughs> they got, we want to hear their, stuff not read it they got there eventually. i also want to ask you guys how you watched this anime did you watch it in the japanese version or the english one because i watched the english dub just because i had the game background so i was curious to see if everyone got brought back on board um i watched it in english because i i i, I i've probably said this on the show a couple of times um nowadays because dubbing has gotten better, I like to watch the English dubs because that way I can kind of multitask where I can be on my computer working on something, but I can also have, you know, a show running in the background. Whereas with subtitles, you have to really sit down and be invested and you got to read everything, which I'm fine with, with, you know, a lot of older shows where the dub, you know, isn't as great, but I still want to watch it. Um, but I, I watched this in English and, you know, for the most part, the acting's not bad. It's, you know, it's, it's it's anime acting, but, you know, it's pretty higher shelf anime acting. Uh, for me, I watched both the dub and the sub. Uh, when it first came out, I obviously watched the sub because I was curious about the anime adaptation to see, uh, excuse me, how they'd, uh, go with it and i was surprised at how good it was and then when i checked out the dub recently as my rewatch before this podcast i was really happy to hear that they brought back the whole entire cast for the yeah dub adaptation which is more than we so can if say. We talk about episode nine then sure Go for it. <laughs> Where yes. Miklio's VA just switched out for a single episode, and it weirded the crap out of me and made me think I was going insane. Yeah. <laughs> no, you were not alone in that boat. It happened to me, too, and it's uh, happened in the second season as well with Saray. Ooh. Wow. Why? Really? Is there, like, an actual um, reason for uh, it? I don't know what the reason is why uh, Robbie Damon left the second season temporarily. I just know, like, after I watched the episode, I'm like, huh, that's not Robbie's voice. I listen, I listen. I'm like, oh, it's Bryce Pappenbrook, the guy who plays uh, Caesar in the English dub of JoJo's Bizarre Advance. Adventure or Zidane from Final Fantasy Nine. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or the main character from Sword Art Online. Oh man, Sword Art. Yeah, that's. I mean that. That's a very small pet peeve of mine, and it's just like. It. it I mean, it can take you out of it if if you're so used to one character's voice and then it just switches, and it's even more annoying if like it's a temporary thing. Um, I mean, Amer- yeah. Amer- American cartoons will do that, 
and hell, they'll do it for like a single scene where like it's just a scratch. Vo- it's like we needed a, a filler voice for a thing, so we'll switch a character's voice for a, a couple scenes. But yeah, for an entire episode, and then just to switch back to the normal one, that's really kind of, uh, kind of odd. <laughs> And it like also really happened with the uh, <laughs> Japanese version, too. But uh, in the case of the Japanese version, uh, Lila's voice actress was replaced because, sadly, her original voice passed away before the uh, adaptation of the anime. Oh. That's right. Yes, I recall that. That happened shortly after the game released, right? I Perfect. believe so. Mm-hmm. But the weird part about the whole voice acting swap is that the other actor did a really good job and it was fine, but it's just like that one little in- moment of inconsistency was just driving me nuts the entire time. Because at first I was like, <laughs> something's not right. Am I crazy? No. <laughs> Something feels off. No, man. I'm, I'm with you there completely. Um, so one thing. Okay. I want to ask you guys this. Um, how do you guys feel about the two episodes of flashback? Because I, I I stopped about halfway through the second one because it's like basically my feeling was with was that I had watched four it was like four or five episodes I think of you know this one set of characters and I was just starting to get used to them and then with no provocation it just switches to this other set of characters and I got to spend two episodes with them um, I was then informed that these are the characters from Bazaria. Um, which the show, at least to my knowledge, made no not made no effort to inform me of that. Um, so I'm curious what you guys think about like the anime's sudden its choice to suddenly you know flash to basically an enti- entirely different game. I actually had to research this because it also threw me for quite a loop. I imagine almost every viewer who watched the episode, especially if you were originally watching it at a weekly release it must have also been very bizarre mm-hmm. to see as well at first i got whiplash when i watched the opening theme which is really great by the way i really like the opening for the show mm-hmm. uh and i Hell saw yes. velvet from tales of berseria in there i was like wait a minute and i paused it and rewind it and it, the camera kind of zooms past her in the opening i'm like why is she here <laughs> and then i watched you know i watched the opening normally and there's a scene at the very end of the opening where she does like an attack or something and i'm like why and then all of a sudden, I believe it's uh, episode five, where mm-hmm. it's the Tales of Berseria show, it's where it starts. Right. And that yep. totally threw me for a loop, and I was very surprised by it. I mean, the adaptation's solid for the Berseria opening, and I think it does a good job at intriguing interest there. But it's handled so poorly in how they introduce it coming, because from what I researched... It's purely there just because in Japan, when this was airing, Tales of Berseria had just come out. And so this was timed to promote the game. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> see, I I wouldn't have had so much so much, yeah, I wouldn't have had so much of a problem with it had there maybe been a lead in um from the other characters like they're, you know, telling some of some past event or there's even some just kind of like some kind of I I I just need some kind of indication is, that tells me this is a flashback. We're just telling some backstory here. We'll get back to the regular story in a bit, but you know we're just taking a bit of a, a detour at the moment. Um, but yeah, for me, um, uh, I was a tiny bit prepared for the flashback episode because it was kind of a passing mention in the episode preview of the previous episode that they would be telling a story from the distant past blah 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 i'm like oh something's going to happen and then when the episode happens i'm like oh they're doing a tales of Basaria episode wait why are they doing tales of Basaria? <laughs> go into the research and i'm like oh tales of Basaria is a 1000 year old prequel to zesteria apparently yeah, you. I, I, my research actually kind of yielded spoilers for the Berseria story that I'm kind of bummed out I came across. Oh, but... I know. I saw the spoilers too, and I've 
watched a full playthrough of the game, so I'm like, okay, now everything makes more sense in Zysteria. Mm -hmm. I'm actually kind of really excited to play Berseria now because I think the kind of the big twist of Berseria's story is very interesting and how that relates to Zysteria. I won't spoil it here because people yeah. can do that on their own easy <laughs> enough. And I also hey. really... Pardon? Yeah, case in point, us. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I mean, we're the, the Tales fans that had to dig deeper and found out the hard way. But I do like how they set up the first two episodes. And I was actually really curious to see that continue. And then when it goes back to Zysteria, you're like, oh, yeah, they're dealing with a huge tornado in Lady Lake. I guess that's important. <laughs> Goodbye, Velvet. Goodbye, everyone. But, uh, but at the same I, time, you're like, I want more. Yeah, I actually did want more. It actually made me much more interested. In, I guess it worked as an ad for the game because I'm certainly more interested in the game now that I saw these two episodes. I'm intrigued to see where that storyline goes, especially with how it does oh, relate to Zysteria. Oh my god. Like, Zysteria, like, from... I will try to keep this as spoiler-free as possible, but that whole story was just one shitstorm of emotions in, like, the most tragic senses possible. And I'm like, this is probably the darkest Tales of game in history. And That's they handled good. it so beautifully. That's and great because in a way, we haven't had an entry like that in forever. Oh, yeah. Like, for me, the most recent entry I could consider a dark entry, and I'm doing air quotes here as I say dark, <laughs> is maybe Zillia 2 at the best. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Well, I, I don't, I don't mean to be the odd man out, but um, when it came to those two, uh, th those two flashback episodes, I gotta be honest, I wasn't too enthralled with the Basaria characters at first. Um, like, like I said, I stopped. I actually s stopped about a third halfway through the second flashback episode, just like skipped to the next episode, just because like I, I, I don't know, I, I didn't feel enthralled with them and I, I was kind of like like you said Darren it was kind of like whiplash where I just gotten used to one set of characters and then it just throws you onto another one is like I probably would have gotten a little more invested with them had it just been Bizaria the show from the beginning rather than them trying to take time for both sides um but yeah I think yeah like try to tie in opening, both together it would have been really cool if they were doing like a back and forth like in between different cuts of like maybe I don't know if it'd be alternating episodes or different parts of episodes and tell different parts of the story and kind of show how they connect at some point. Mm -hmm. I don't know if maybe if that was the grand plan at some point for production, but I think that would have been a way better way of handling this because it is total whiplash. It just kind of lambasts you with, oh, it's Berseria now. Don't worry about it. And I also am really bummed I didn't get to see more because Edna's brother, Aizen, is actually one of the party members. You see him in the... Uh, opening with you see at the very end of episode hmm. uh, six i believe which is the last yeah. berseria episode in this uh anime it shows the opening from the game where aizen is kind of there hmm. as not a dragon you see a few flashback uh scenes of aizen in the episode and and her brother is introduced as well Oh, like this really tall guy with the messy blonde hair that looks similar to hers. <laughs> I gotcha. Um, so we're getting here back to the end here. So I actually, I have, I have one last question for you guys. Um, obviously I'm not a good example because, you know, I'm, I'm bad at watching TV apparently. Um, but for... <laughs> <laughs> Um, they pulled me out of TV watching the cat and I couldn't do it. <laughs> hey, you're doing a podcast about TV and you're saying you're bad at TV. I'm bad at TV. JD, that's not healthy for your podcast. You need to go to some camps for that. They'll teach you good how to watch the TV right. I don't do my job well. Um, but what I want to ask is that if someone was interested in Tales, would you guys suggest watching this before... Uh, playing the game or would you suggest playing the game first before watching this and do you guys think that watching this pre-game kind of 
hurts would would possibly hurt your perception of the game i think it probably would because hysteria by most means is kind of like a mediocre entry in the series even for those who really like it they have to kind of recognize there's a lot not great about the title and i think the one advantage of this adaptation is that it's available on a much cheaper streaming service so if you pay your five dollars a month or your ten dollars a month you get to watch this really beautiful better told version of that story i mean i'm assuming it's a better told version till the end because i haven't seen the (laughs) second season yet but from what i've seen of this first season that we're talking about i would say so far it's much better executed and i would probably say i'd recommend watching this over playing the game just because it's cheaper and you are if you're playing the games as rpgs for the story you will get more out of this anime adaptation than the game itself likely Mm. although if you're someone who's there for the combat and you and you want to experience the game because you like the Tales combat, you'll probably go with the game, but I'd say wait for a sale. Fair enough. Agreed. Um, for me personally, I would... I'd definitely say play the game first, despite how mediocre and poor the t- storytelling is. Uh, I think what failed for the... Uh, game storyline wise is that uh tales games are really well known for portraying the world in black and white with a very visible shade of gray a like a very moral gray area like for vesperia as an example you look at yuri who is a very anti-hero type character and then when you look at Zysteria, it's it's very painted black and white. You got Saray the hero and the bad guy, and it's just like, he is bad because The bad guy is literally called the Lord of Calamity. It's like the most evil <laughs> title you can give to a person without calling them like the Antichrist or something. <laughs> he, I think they couldn't go with Antichrist because it's too religious. But in a sense... In essence, Tales of Zysteria is basically Jesus versus the Antichrist game. <laughs> yeah, that's a very apt way of describing it. That is that is the core struggle there. And I think that's where it fails, because it doesn't bring that moral gray in the middle. It, try, it tries to in parts of the game, but it fails fails miserably because it's too late into the game when they start introducing it and that's where character development also fails because it's too far into the game Hmm. and that's why i would say like the anime adaptation is superior because it it tries to rectify the flaws the game brought onto itself by bringing back the moral gray, bringing the character development sooner rather than later. But at the same time, I would still say play the game first, experience the game the whole way through, so that way you are knowledgeable right off the bat of the lore and the background of the world and then when you go into this anime you will have a better appreciation for the world because i feel like this anime adaptation is kind of uh, the tales series way of saying we're sorry we (laughs) fucked up on this game hardcore (laughs) Yeah, well, even with Tales of Berseria, it seems like they kind of recognized what did and did not work with Zysteria, and I guess this anime... The equipment is, system was bullshit! <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. Like, even with Berseria going like, yo, 60 frames per second, we get it, we get it, you guys were really upset about the frame rate, we're sorry. <laughs> and now you have this well, beautiful and anime even like, to look at. Yeah. And even, like, the overworld in the Zysteria world, like, some of the backgrounds, like, um, God, I'm trying to think of the place. Uh, Not Highland, is it? 
is it Rollins that's the other empire? Yeah. Yeah, like the outside map of the city, it's like just a long block wall of stone wall. And I'm like, really, guys, that's the best you can do for a detailed outside view of the city. Uh, just a long, tall brick wall. <laughs> In a long, overarching field of grass. <laughs> that like, still that's has the best pop he in. could do. <laughs> oh, oh boy. Uh, well, Luke obviously has some some beef with the game, <laughs> but um. So <laughs> I, I do. You'll probably be, I... seldom meet someone who does not have beef with the game. <laughs> There is beef to be had with that title. <laughs> like, if anything, if anything, I can say for the greatness that Basari brought and this adam- anime adaptation, the least I can say is that there's maybe hope in the world that Zestiria might get the remake treatment like the PS3 version of Vesperia did, hmm. and will try to fix all the problems at all the Basaria lore, and for the love of God, keep Alicia as a permanent playable party member. <laughs> Who can armatize. Yeah. Well, one one can dream. But um I I, le- I think I, I'm dreaming. Yeah. I think I think as far as the anime goes, I think it's a, a ringing endorsement from both of you guys that, you know, if you're maybe a tales fan already or if maybe you're interested in uh you know the the world of of tales that you know maybe this is worth checking out um you know maybe i i'm not gonna say i didn't enjoy my time with the with in 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 the anime and i will most likely you know check out season two since i think it's uh about to wrap up here um oh yeah i i mean i was lost i have zero idea exactly what's going on in that world but you know it was pretty i grew to like the characters um so you know that's a, a mostly thumbs up for me so uh if anyone listening hey jd yo. question for you oh who out of all the characters who was your favorite <sighs> don't put me on spot like this um, I'll put you on the spot, buddy. It's a, double, it's a double put on the spot because he also has to recall their name. <laughs> yes. Um. <laughs> fuck. What's her name? The. The uh, the merchant girl. What's her name? Rose. Rose. Yeah. Here we go. I don't know. I like. I don't know. She was when you're introduced to her. She's really kind of snarky, and I like her kind of rapport with Saray at that. That their first interaction. I don't know. She charmed me. <laughs> I know you. I know you. Have- I remember you say. I remember you saying to me last night when you were giving me your live updates that she sort of reminded you of Rita. She does. I, I saw her ways. in the intro and was like, "Why is Rita in this show?" <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just her her outfit or whatever. But um. Yeah, I even I even messaged you like one because there'd been a few episodes since she'd been in, and I even messaged you was like, "When's the merchant girl coming back? She's in the intro." <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know. <laughs> um, but I think t- to be fair, I do think the anime handles her probably better than the game handles her introduction, and she seems oh God, to be yes. written in a much more moral gray area, especially with her background, which I won't get into detail here. Sure. <laughs> Er, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Rose is handled way better in the anime than she was in the game. Sadly, I think the game just... I think what a lot of people have problems with with her is that she was the shoehorned replacement for Alicia. And... Uh, there were times her character felt like Mary Sue in some regards Lucas just mad but, Lu- uh, Lucas just mad that Alicia and Saray never boned oh yes. god <laughs> everyone knows the best ship is the Miklio Saray ship that's the ship oh, everyone come. supports hey I may be gay but even I think there was way too much gay subtext there with Miklio so and Saray much. 
<laughs> Let's go buy ice cream together. Oh, yeah. There's and it's a like, thing. I'll like, buy the, you ice cream. There was gay subtext phrase. in the gay subtext. Oh, dude. There's one of the skits at the end of the episode. Like, they're talking. To, I don't remember what the fuck they're talking about. Uh, but basically, Saray is telling uh Miglio that he has to make him ice cream or something. He's like, you two are so gay. <laughs> he or like one of or the episode before the flashback for the skit. Uh they're like, we're going off to a hot spring. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, mm, yeah you are. He's like, guys, tone it down just a little bit. Come on. <laughs> like something also, I want to address this. Because this is something that kind of stood out to me more in the anime than it did in the game. But it really started to bother me about how uh, Alicia doesn't wear pants because every other character in the world wears pants, especially if they're like a knight, like she is, and other like female knights are there with like their full like plated leggings. And I'm sitting there going like, why doesn't she have that? She wears short shorts. <laughs> that doesn't answer more the mobility. question. Female anime <laughs> physics. Yeah, that, that, that's the answer. But it just, it just oh, stood Jesus. out to me more in this anime because there's more characterization to some of the side characters, like the different knights that are under her who are female. And it's like, no, oh, Darren, like, Darren, the thing you should be questioning more of is uh, how the hell Velvet's undercleavage. Thank you! No, Velvet, <laughs> Velvet's outfit makes zero sense. I will never understand how that works and why she never, as soon as she escapes that island, why she doesn't buy new clothes, because why? I, I don't know. Like, Edgy, as, I guess. Like, as soon as that episode came on, I was just testing Luke, Luke on, like, every other comment is like, and tits! Because, <laughs> like, Velvet and What's-Her-Face's tits are just like, how are those staying in there? Physics doesn't like work how that way. How are they way. in there? It's and then magic, how, damn it! Those women must have like seriously strong backs. <laughs> the strongest. Oh god, anime! What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> Don't ask, oh, Katie. Lord. Don't ask I, because I I just like the answer will quiet. never end. Um. So. <laughs> Before we uh, we wrap up here, is there anything else you guys wanted to say in defense or against this this anime? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, overall, I really enjoyed the adaptation. I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it going in because the game, I did lose interest probably roughly around the halfway point, maybe just a little bit past that. And so I was curious to see how this would handle the same stuff I've seen already. Like when it's when it, it really surprised me when it started up when we get that a new Alicia episode, and I was like, "Wow, like I'm engaged because this is actually new material and this is a much stronger introduction." So I do think that if you're someone who overlooked this because you played the game and you did not like how it handled it, this is probably something that is worth giving another chance to because it does amend a lot of the narrative shortcomings and storytelling shortcomings of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm basically in the same boat. If you felt that uh, Zysteria wasn't a strong or enjoyable series to you, uh, definitely give the anime a shot at, because it will it will definitely re- rejuvenate your love <laughs> for a Tales series, especially in an animated format. Yeah. Well, as we have mentioned a couple times, but it's goddamn beautiful looking. Hell yeah, man. Oh my god, yes. Like, Watch it for the artistry art alone. style <laughs> is just like 15 out of 10 for that <laughs> beautiful, beautiful scenery and art and choreography. You know what? I did think of something damning about this first season. Oh, There's yeah? not enough Edna. <laughs> the game has there a bit is more not time enough with Edna. Edna. We do not have enough. Is there of ever our enough? Sassy, snarky, little tiny. Well, role. in the game, there's a section where she's the only party member with you. That's kind of skipped out here, and that's kind of a little interesting moment of giving more her more screen time and attention. I, I think she almost gets more time in the skits at the end of episodes than she does in the episodes. <laughs> There are also some skits in the game where she just slays. <laughs> it's like there's um, one skit where you find a poisonous flower or that's an equivalent to arsenic. 
And the whole time she's trying to explain or rather hint at it to Miklio, she's making ass puns. <laughs> because arse, Nick. That's funny. So she's calling Miklio butt <laughs> or you ass. <laughs> butt jokes. <laughs> well, um, so, yeah, uh, if you want to check this out, I don't know where it's at. Maybe on Crunchyroll. I don't know. but <laughs> It's on uh, Funimation's streaming service. There you go. In both uh, dub and sub. There you go. Um, so, yeah. Go um, for it. Yeah, so in the comments below, let us know if you're a Tales fan and if you've watched this, what you thought of it. We'd love to hear um, what you guys think about this as well. Um, and just want to thank everyone for listening and I also want to thank you two guys for being on here again and helping me navigate my way through the Tales world. <laughs> it's a scary place with a lot of boobs that don't bounce out of shirts. It's a, it's a very worrisome place in that regard, but I'm glad to be on again. It was a lot of fun to talk about it. I certainly appreciate yeah, those... some parts of this anime more after discussing it. <laughs> Yeah, those uh, double Ds know how to keep themselves tucked in in some magical way. Yeah. Uh, before we go, Darren, uh, do you want to plug your channel over here real quick? I will always plug my channel at every available opportunity. So I'm from the Gaming Pilgrimage. That's what as, you JD, said. <laughs> as JD mentioned, it's a uh, YouTube channel which is mainly dedicated to reviewing various RPGs. And as of now, I have covered all of the Tales games except Zisteria fully and Berseria, which I hope to do in the coming few months, hopefully. And in the meantime, I'll be releasing some content related to Shimagami Tensei in a uh, different review retrospective. So that's where I can be found on YouTube. Cool. And we'll definitely make sure to leave a link in the com or in the uh, info whatever thing so you guys can go subscribe to his channel because he makes good content. He... Darren, Darren is the reason I, I got like started playing Tales games, so <laughs> makes me happy to hear it. Yeah. Hopefully no one hopefully no one does that with hysteria then blames me and goes, <laughs> Why? Don't attack Darren. Why you Darren? Why did you introduce me to this horrible game? <laughs> Why did you make me buy this? <laughs> uh, Alright. Alright guys, uh, well, thanks for listening and we'll uh, we'll catch you next week. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>